Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by the UPS Store Canada. Yeah, looky here. <laughs> <laughs> Time for another episode of the Standing By podcast. It's season five, and I, I think the most important thing uh, for me to address, Ted, is. Will you be able to get my vacuum pack smoke meat for me tomorrow? I will be able to. Okay. This is the season finale. Yes. And Terry wants to take some smoked meat uh, back to BC with it's him. It's a must. So I will pick that up for you at God Snowden you. Deli uh, after I get a good night's sleep because we've done all 10 episodes in a row this time around. Mm-hmm. We've been in the studio for 23 hours, and boy, does it smell bad in here. <laughs> Our last guest threw up. <laughs> I might have made that up. Yeah. That might not be true. She's a little bright. Um, Of course, uh, now that uh, I'm uh, out west in British Columbia, um, can't go home without certain things. Um, My uh, lovely wife, Jessica, uh, has a new job. She was able to uh, escape from the Death Star and uh, has a new job that she absolutely loves. And uh, unfortunately... You can't start a job and then go in four days later and say, hey, do you mind if I go away for a week? So I'm uh, flying solo. So uh, the uh, uh, ticket home must include a uh, loaf of rye bread, a vacuum pack smoked meat, some cheese curds, and some bagels from the Snowden Dell. Now, could you conceivably, and here's a segue for you, could you conceivably send that via the UPS store? Yes, you could, you could. eh? Yeah, you. They could ship smoked meat Absolutely, out to they BC. Could. They will properly pack it and get it to uh, my home in BC. That's one of the things I could opt for. Um, is I could take it to the UPS store and uh, have them look after it for me. Properly pack it, tape it up, get labels on it, and uh, get it shipped via UPS. That's that's one of the services they offer. They are our. Title sponsor, as we like to call them, and the podcast is uh, proudly sponsored, we believe. I think I can say that. Of course. By the UPS Store Canada. Um, You may be familiar with them if you run a small business, uh, because they offer everything that can help uh, make the day easier if you run a small business, from home especially. A lot of people are doing businesses from their basements and garages these days, and if you need help with packaging and shipping, they can look after that. If you need a mailbox, another address um, to have sh- stuff shipped to, they have mailbox services. It's something a lot of people use. They can even help you with your passport. And, of course, they can help you get stuff uh, shipped across the country and get it properly packed, too. A lot of people use them uh, for sending stuff out to the kids who've gone uh, off to college or kids who've left the province and moved to, to another part of the world. And uh, people have... Uh, uh, shipped, uh, you know, household goods that they really care about, like we did when we moved. When the uh, moving trucks were gone and there was leftover stuff, we went to the UPS store. There are 370 locations all across the country, all run by entrepreneurs just like you who live in your community and understand uh, the challenges of your day that they can help with. Find the location nearest you by going to the UPS store. Ca. And ship some smoked meat to your Auntie Jessica out in Langley, there, BC. There you Why go. don't you? Speaking of smoked meat, we went to Snowden Deli during Terry's uh, time in town this time around. And I don't remember the last time I went to Snowden Deli. It would have been with you yeah. when you still lived here. And it was like uh, it was like stepping back into time in yep. a way because I used to live in that part of town, not not in that immediate part of town, <coughs> but in NDG, not yeah. not too far away. So I used to spend a lot of time in that part of town, and it was uh, uh, it was quite nostalgic for me to go back there. And it reminded me as well that uh, as much as you can live on the West Island or in uh, Vaudreuil, Soulange, Hudson, Saint Lazare, Vaudreuil, and have everything you need out there, and avoid the hassles of crossing bridges and getting stuck in traffic, there's still something very special about going into the city Agreed. and about certain areas of the city, and that's such a unique 
neighborhood. And uh, and it seemed to me a lot had changed, but a lot hadn't changed. Yep. As I was walking up and down that street, Terry was in doing a podcast with Bill Brownstein and Leslie Chesterman and uh, Aaron Rand, who do their podcast from the Snowden Deli. So I was going up and down the street running errands, and it was it was uh, it was nice. It I is liked nice. it. Yeah, yeah it's I a, really enjoyed reconnecting with that part of the city. Yeah, and it's a very Montreal part of the city oh. in in its own way. It's not like downtown. Nope. But there's something special about NDG Code Saint Luke. That whole area. Um, as you pointed out, a lot of different ethnic fa- uh, factions over mm-hmm. the years. and uh, Becoming increasingly Russian, yeah. it seems. And there are a lot of things, you know, and this is what I you know, love about Montreal, and that's why I lament what's happening downtown. Because when you, when you walk up and down um, Queen Mary Road, it reminds me of, you know, an era when there were small businesses and tailors and shoemakers and that kind of thing. I'm not suggesting we go back to the horse and buggy days, but there's something comforting and very familiar about those businesses that have been there for a long time, like the Snowden Dell. Mm -hmm. You know, the Snowden Dell is a family-owned business. I know I'm always going on about family-owned businesses. They've been there for over 75 years now. And right next to them is, you know, where I get my glasses still at Literacits. Uh, Another family-owned business. Imre and Janelle, and Imre's in there with his mom, his uh, dad unfortunately passed away years ago, but they um, they've been there a very long time. And as you as you noticed, Ted, when you walk up and down that street, there's something comforting about it, yeah. something really nice. And by the way, um, when people always ask me over the years, people would come to town and say, "Where's Schwartz's?" And I'd say, "Well, Schwartz's is on Saint Laurent, and yes, world famous, interesting and wonderful experience. You got to line up for it." But if you want a really, really, really good old school experience, and my favorite smoked meat, you have to go to Snowden Dell. What's the Snowden Theater now? Did they not renovate that into something? Yes. Not condos. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's condos. Yep. It's a condo building. Uh, I'll give them credit. They kept the Snowden Theater sign and and tried to do the best job they could with the facade, but uh, condos. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum, and I don't want to go on and on about it, like your aunt Edna's ass. But um, you know, that's the thing about uh, when you get to the corner of Atwater and St. Catherine, and the hospital is gone, mm-hmm. and there's that giant tower there yeah. now. Is that a condo tower? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and you stand at the corner. Um, you know, if you stand uh, where the hill crests, if you come up, you walk up the hill. Uh, up at water, yeah, up at water, and walk towards where the hospital used to be. Used to be able to look up the hill and see the mountain and whatever. And it's all been blocked out now by these, you know, really imposing towers. And I find the one at the corner of you know where the hospital was, I find it really imposing. Not particularly eye pleasing. Uh, nobody gives a shit what I think, but you know that's that's my opinion and take on it. And as you drive down Rene Levesque, the the Montreal vibe is kind of gone, you know, where you would see um, church steeples and old school buildings and, you know, places where the nuns used to be and all of that. And you could drive by and turn your head to the right and see the Bell Center. You know, the Bell Center is an iconic place. You can't see that from driving down uh, René Levesque now. It's, it's, it's kind of altered the vibe of the city, in my opinion. Um, I get it, density, evolution, blah, blah, blah. But I think I think you risk taking away uh, the things that made the city unique. I wonder if 50 years from now people will say things like, you know, I miss the condo tower. Yeah. I, the corner maybe. Atwater and St. Catherine. Maybe. And I miss Fairview. Remember Fairview? <laughs> yeah. Fairview was great. You'd go out there. There was the Gap. There was Old Navy, and, the Apple Store. Yeah, it's it's possible. Yeah, but. because who knows where we're going to be. Well, I know where we're going to be 50 years from yes, now. Sir. But, yeah. but who knows where society is going to yeah. be. Well, you I'd know? like to wish them well. Yeah, good yeah. luck to you. As, yeah. as Particularly as wealth uh, becomes more and more concentrated, yeah. uh, I have no idea where it's going to go. Well, and in this, a way, I'm kind of glad I won't be around to see it. This is the thing about you know these condos. That building at the corner of... Uh, where the hosp- the children's hospital was at Atwater and St. Catherine, um, or Atwater and René Lebec, if you like, 
that building, from my understanding, is is fairly um, exclusive. That it's not cheap to buy a condo. No it's not doubt. Che- not no cheap doubt. to buy a condo anywhere no. now. No. Um, and if you know, for example, in the godforsaken Griffin Town, <laughs> in those metal ugly boxes that have blighted the land down by the Lachine Canal, where you can't drive a car or walk in a park because every piece of fucking land has been taken up by a goddamn developer um in that area of town you know a seven eight hundred square foot condo is you know three four five hundred thousand dollars who's you know that's you know you can't first of all you can't put your family in a one-bedroom condo of course not. and uh and secondly uh you know who's going to be able to that's that's not what you call housing it's not housing for the for the masses. No, it's becoming increasingly like what you see in very populous nations of Asia, mm-hmm. where they're just jamming people yeah. like sardines into these high rises, uh, one on top of the other. And it's just, I don't know, I just don't like where it's going. No, me neither. I, and I've I've been a beneficiary of what's happened to real estate because, you know, the home that Jess and I own in British Columbia has increased in value in the two years that we've been there. BC is particularly ridiculous. I think the average price of a one-bedroom apartment in Vancouver is close to three grand a month. You know, that's really kind of wacky and crazy. But, I, you know, you and I were driving around Bay Durfe yesterday where you you and I both used to live, Mm -hmm. and I look at those homes and I go, really? Yeah. A million five? Yeah. Really? Like I don't, you know, I get supply and demand and the economics of the real estate market, but I just, you know, it just seems out of whack to me. Yeah. Here's an idea. Let's stop our belly aching and have a couple of laughs. What do you say? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm very Are you comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> Make yourself at home. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm very sorry. As you can see, I'm having oh, yes. a carbonated go. soft yep. drink, which jumped up on me there, Poseidon. I'm sorry. No, it's, it every it's, time. Not, it's not just house prices rising. You're, <laughs> <laughs> you're wearing headphones. I'm very sorry yeah, about that. <laughs> so the last time we did Jesus. a solo podcast, just you and me, we forgot to do the, do the tweet sheets. So mm-hmm. for the season finale, we have two tweet sheets, and I thought we could do one at the beginning and uh, one towards the end. So let's do one right here, yeah. right now. What do you say? Here's some of the funny from Twitter. Here's one from at Cool Math Game. Jesus, I will die on the cross and wake up the next day. Me, awesome. So you can still help me move. Jesus, I meant three days. I will wake up in three days. <laughs> Sounds clever. Even Jesus doesn't want to help you move. By the way, the cutoff for calling your friends and offering pizza and beer to move is 30. There you go. Once you're 30, yeah, get yeah, your act sure. together. 30 at the, at the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From at Soul Yodler, life is short. Stop and smell stuff. Steal a Twix and sell it to an orphan. <laughs> Chase some pigeons and start a trash fire. Who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite particular. It's a Twix yeah, that you have to give to really, an orphan. Hey? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. And from Matt Gully Ver, this is my first voice to text tweet, and so far so good. Period. No, don't say period. Put a period. <laughs> Jesus, actual fucking hell. What is this thing doing? No, don't type that. Fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> Anybody who's used the voice feature on the phone would find that very funny. I figured you'd like that because I know you voice text all (laughs) the time. All the time. Have you ever been in the middle of a voice text and you get distracted by something and you start to have a convert? Like, this happens to me on the air sometimes. I'll be on the radio show. I'll be voice texting someone and then, oh, shit, I'm, i got to go on here. And I'll go on and I'll forget to turn off the voice text. And when I'm done on the air, I look at my voice text and it's the entire break that I've just done on the radio. Very helpful for the person yeah. you're texting. Here's what I was saying on the radio. Yeah. Aren't you excited? Why is Ted telling me that that was uh, we're here for a good time, not a long time by who did that Trooper. again? Trooper. Yeah, yeah. Trooper. Here's, that's a nice segue into one of the things I wanted to ask you. We've both been in radio for a very long time. Not me anymore, but you still have well, a show. Well, you too. You do the weekend yeah, show. Yeah, that's with, true. We do uh, the do, weekend do show the together weekend on show Light 106.7. Yeah. And online at uh, light1067.ca. Yeah. 
ca mm -hmm. and on the iheart radio app and your smart speakers saturday yes. mornings nine to noon if you want a little taste of terry and ted nostalgia join us yeah. won't you we do the uh, shenanigans there and yep. uh, the the program is brought to you by uh our good friend uh, uh michael uh, eskenazi and his company called felix and norton cookies and also the mersons Mercen Automotive, long, long time they support supporters. us wherever we are. We should, you know, we thought we'll plug the radio show because when we're on the radio show, we plug the podcast. We're all over the place. Speaking of radio, I thought about this before when we were talking about something. I don't remember what. Um, let's talk about some of the records that if you never hear again, it'll be too soon. Well, with me, there's two. Yeah. And everybody knows this from our days at Shome. <laughs> there's Black Betty. Yep. By, by Ram Jam. Yep. Yeah. Whoa, black cling. <laughs> <laughs> because we used to play that so much. And the other one we always used to play that I never liked because I thought the, the lyrics were so vapid was Rock and Roll All Night by Kiss. Such a piece of shit. That's so <laughs> let me get this straight. You want to rock and roll all night and party every day? Have I got that straight? <laughs> It's pretty obvious because they repeat it over and over and over and over and over again in the song. I know they have their fans. Yeah. They go, they, they, well, the oh, kiss, big time. Yeah. Kiss, Army, kiss Army. Yeah. yeah they'll come out. I just us. always that thought that yeah. song was a piece of junk. And yeah, the fact that is. we played it so much yeah. on Shom. Other songs that we played to death, like there were some good songs yeah. that we played to death too that I'm burned out on. Layla is one. <laughs> yeah, the acoustic version of Layla yeah, from beautiful. Eric Clapton's yeah. Unplugged album. I can still listen to that, but the original Layla, uh, I've had quite enough of that, and and that's not to detract from it as a song. I just heard it so much. I'm probably in the same uh, boat with you on all of those songs. I mean, Kiss have their fans, and I guess they were a terrific touring band, but poets they were not. No. They, no. In any way, shape, or form. No, but uh, businessmen and marketers, in particular, yes. Gene Simmons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that really, I really couldn't stand, and still to this day, I cannot stand, is Taking Care of Christmas by Backman Turner oh Overdrive. Yeah, that's a bad plan. I love Christmas and I love Christmas music. And somebody must have said to Randy Backman, hey, let's write a Christmas song. And Randy said, no, fuck that. We'll just rewrite the <laughs> lyrics to taking care of business, and we'll change business to Christmas. Okay. I was going to say it seemed to work for them, but did it? Do we? Do, does well, that song get much airplay at it, Christmas time? It, it does because in Canada, you're always looking for Canadian hits, right? Because you're obliged to because, play yeah, a, certain a certain percentage, percentage of, Canadian of Canadian content Canadian music. And um, I, you know, it's one of the great joys of that job. Uh, was you could, you know, you could, well, not so much in the morning show, but when I started, you you know, you could, uh, when I was doing the all-night show, when when there was such a thing as somebody on the radio from midnight to six, um, and that's where a lot of uh, broadcasters my age got their start, um, that's where, you know, you could spend the whole night, uh, well, you did spend the whole night in the studio with the speakers cranked listening to uh, an amazing array of music that you chose, yeah. which was uh, an ideal way to learn about the radio business. Now, uh, unfortunately, in the radio business, uh, whatever you hear overnight is usually uh, automated, and there's usually nobody in the studio. Yeah, and it's programmed by someone in another city Yeah, who doesn't know your city. And in Montreal, I think that's a particularly egregious way to run a radio station because there are, as you know, there are certain bands and certain songs that are so unique to Montreal or Montrealers have, even if they're not from Montreal, Montrealers have embraced those bands, those artists, those albums, those songs. And an example of something that never gets old for me and, uh, and Montrealers have always loved them is super trap. I can still yeah. listen to crime of the century yeah. and breakfast in America. Those yeah. two albums will never get tired yeah. for me. And part of it is because they have such a Montreal connection. Crime of the Century, yeah, Crime of the Century and Crisis What Crisis um, really, really took off after Shom got behind them. And you don't hear is, them much. Did I get the name of the album wrong? Is Was Breakfast in America on Crisis What Crisis? No, or no, those two no, different Bre albums? No, Breakfast in America. Is an album? It, it's okay. an album with the waitress on the cover. Yes, that's, yeah. That's Breakfast in America. That was their biggest album. It was, uh, yeah. Yeah, but the career really got started with Crime of the Century in mm -hmm. Montreal and Crisis What Crisis 
I think is also a masterwork. These are records you don't hear on the radio anymore, and by and large, and shame on Shome for not playing them still. If yeah, they, if I, they don't, I I can't I can't comment on it because yeah. obviously I don't listen to them anymore, and uh, um, I I don't I don't know what they're up to, um, but I would venture to guess in an age where music is chosen by people in an office outside of the province, you know, a lot of radio companies have chosen to program their music from Toronto, from Edmonton, from other places around the country, and given the responsibility of programming the music you listen to, to a guy who's sitting at a desk in Edmonton who doesn't know who Harmonium is, doesn't know who Babe Ruth is, has never heard of Richard Charlebois, has never heard of Beau Dommage. You know, these are, yes, older bands that maybe not everybody has heard of, but they speak to the community that the radio station is supposed to serve. Well, you know what? Maybe you and I are out of date, and maybe uh, they don't play those records anymore because they're trying to target a younger crowd to whom or with whom that music doesn't resonate. Uh, but it's pretty hard to get a younger crowd to listen to the radio. The younger crowd is here. They're, yeah, they're on their phone with yeah. their uh, with their AirPods. I think it's a fool's errand. I really do because I I don't you know you have kids that age. Yeah. Sam Bird, Charlie Bird. They don't listen to the radio. I, they're, they're not up only in, if they're in the car with their mom and she's listening to the radio. Yeah, it's usually it's usually people you know over thirty five uh, that use the. Ra- I don't even use the radio anymore. I never leave the house, um, and I'm I'm not being glib. I never leave the house without making sure I have podcasts on my phone. And there are a number of podcasts that I go to. I really like a Smart List with Jason Bateman and. Will Arnett and uh, other guy from Thing. Um, <laughs> his, his name is escaping me. The guy from Will and Grace. Um, and his name is escaping me. I listen to that one. There's a great history podcast I listen to by uh, John Meacham, who's uh, just a, a terrific historian and, uh, and commentator. Uh, Rob Lowe has a pretty good podcast that you can, uh, you can check out. And these are... Uh, I was a big West Wing fan, so now my wife and I are listening to West Wing Weekly, which was out a few years ago. And, uh, you know, when you turn on the radio and you go, oh, my God, what is happening there? Um, I quickly plug in the phone and make sure there's a podcast available. Here's an old guy question for you. When you listen to podcasts, does it chew up your uh, your data, your cellular data? Yeah, you have to, well... Um, from, if you download it, you should be that's okay, the thing. shouldn't you? That's what I mean. I always make sure my phone has podcasts that have been downloaded right. at home, you know, on the Wi-Fi at home. And once it's downloaded, you're okay. You're just listening to your phone. So it's, if you're out and you, and you, if you're already out and you just bring it up on the run, yeah. then, then you're, it's going to uh, chew ka-ching. into your data. Yeah, okay. ka-ching. Yeah. Have you had that happen? Have you had your data disappear? Yeah, I've got That's every, fun, eh? Yeah, every once in a while I'll get a note from uh, Videotron saying you owe us another million dollars because <laughs> you've gone over on your thing. <laughs> And you know what? I usually call them and bellyache, and uh, they usually uh, give me a break. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's telecom yeah, companies. I f- yeah, I find video Videotron's customer service is actually pretty good. They'll listen to you at least. Yeah. They don't go, too bad, sir. You're <laughs> shit out of luck. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Yeah. I don't give it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, a podcast where, uh, obviously, or an episode, by the way, where we uh, we don't have a, a guest as uh, we close up the season. And uh, this particular season has been uh, uh, chocolate block full of guests. When I was counting them last night, Ted, I think you and, uh, you and I have only done two on our own. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Yeah, this is the second and final one that we've done on our own. Uh, the season opened with Mrs. DeMonte. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Jessica DeMonte talking about uh, the bedside vigil mm. uh, as you um, flirted between. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Between dimensions, yeah, yes. <laughs> Following your uh, open yeah. heart surgery, that was that was it was fascinating to, uh, and and heartwarming and all kinds of different emotions. Listening to Jess talk about, I'm glad that to hear you say that vigil. because she was concerned that uh, she should not have been. Yeah, yeah, she was concerned that she wasn't telling a good story. No, she told a yeah. great story. She's a natural on the microphone. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And she, um, she helped save my life. Um, thank you, sweetheart. She she stood vigil by my bedside for you know twelve hours a day plus, and um, she had to walk into the hospital. 
And the only reason I know this is because we went back to the hospital to thank the nurses. So when we went back to the hospital, uh, we brought a gift for the nurses, and I brought a letter that, you know, the nurses have a, in the uh, Vancouver General Hospital, they have an ICU, you know, I was in an ICU, the cardiac ICU. And um, when you're in intensive care, there's a nurse with you 24-7. You're never not attended to. I don't remember because I was unconscious for a lot of it. But there's always a, a nurse, one nurse per patient, one-to-one. You know, there's one nurse looking after you 24-7, keeping an eye on you. And uh, so I, I, I was completely taken with these angels called nurses. And uh, we bought a gift for them. And, and they have in the, in the nursing station, they have a billboard where they put cards up and stuff that they get from patients. And I, I wrote a letter and wanted them to know how, how grateful I was. And when we went back to the hospital that day, after I had been out of the hospital for about a, a month, I was walking up this long hallway towards the ICU door. And at one point, Jess stopped. We were both walking together, and she said, hang on a minute. And she gulped a couple of times and began to choke back the tears uh. because it was traumatic. And I found it afterwards she made this walk up this long hallway approaching the ICU doors, not knowing what she was going to find <laughs> because the day before she had left and I was still unconscious and the doctors were saying, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And I, re I knew that it was a difficult journey for her, but then I realized that day we were walking down this long hallway. Um, what a, how much courage she needed to do that every day. And you walk down this long hallway and you get to the doors and you have to pick up the phone because the doors are locked and you're not allowed in there because they're trying to make sure that you don't bring any infections into the ICU and they, that there's not, you know, they, they keep visitors to a minimum because there are people on death's door in the, in the ICU when I was one of them. And you pick up the phone and you say, hi, it's, it's Jessica. I'm here to see Terry DeMonte. And sometimes they would say, um, we're in the middle of a procedure. Can you come back in 10 minutes? And they wouldn't tell her what was going on. So in the middle of a procedure with you? They wouldn't, they wouldn't okay. elaborate. All right. So then she would think, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's happening? Yeah. So, it, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm telling stories out of school a little bit, but just to give you an idea of how she was my advocate you know, you need somebody to say, you know, the nurses would look at me and say, you know, why is he sweating so much? Is that his fever? And she would say, no, he's he's always hot. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't like it when things are warm. So that's probably what that is. They looked at my legs and saw some patches of psoriasis. And they thought, one of the doctors said, oh, that, that could be sepsis. That could be a sign of sepsis. And Jess was there to say, um, no, those are patches. Calm of, yeah, yeah, those are <laughs> those are patches of psoriasis and questions about what drugs to give. And you know, anyway, she she was my knight in shining armor, yeah. and I will be forever grateful. Tell me this, uh, and I don't know if you can answer this because you would only get the information secondhand. But I'm sure that you must have heard. How did your parents deal with all of this? Because they were back in Iron Prior, Ontario, while yep. you were in Vancouver, BC, and I know how close you are with your parents. They must have been absolutely beside themselves. I think so. I, I don't I don't know. I really haven't asked. I know that when we made a trip in April, I came out to primarily to see them and we tagged on a few days at the end so I could introduce Christaberg at Plaza des Arts. And when I went to visit them, my mom, as soon as she saw me, she as she was putting her arms around me, she burst into tears. So I, I know that they were probably getting, I'm guessing, camouflaged information from my brother Dean. My brother Dean was a, um, a helicopter paramedic. So he has, you know, a pretty good medical background. Uh, he did that for years. He has his own company now. Um, and anyway, um, Dean was getting all the information from He Jess. really stepped up. Eh? He, he did. came out. He came out he to did. BC. He did because he was getting all of the numbers from Jess. What's his oxygen level? What are they giving him? What And Jess was giving him all the information. And at one point, 
um, he was alarmed by what he was hearing and he had to go out. He, he said, you know, he dropped what he was doing and he jumped on an airplane and he, <clears throat> he flew out to Vancouver to stand watch with Jess and interact with the doctors and nurses. And um, I, I don't know, but I, I think he probably said to my mom and dad, no, no, it's okay. I'm just going out. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going out to, you know, to give Jess a hand and, and see how he's doing and I'll report back to you. But he told my sister, I'm going out because Terry's knocking on heaven's door. Well, he must have been a great support to Jessica. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, and you know, when people do these kinds of things where you, you just, you know, like, you just don't know how to say thank you. Like, I bought him golf. Well, like, I bought him golf balls. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> you know? do it because he was no. looking for thanks or credit. No, I know I know that. But I cannot tell you, you know, when when people come riding to your rescue in 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 a time of need that way. Um, and it, you know, for me, it was Jess. Jess was all, all by herself. Like I, I said to somebody this morning, she took the worst of it. God, I was asleep for yeah. 20 days or whatever yeah. it was. But yeah, my, uh, my brother Dean and, and Jess were, uh, um, I think were key elements to me, uh, recovering because the doctor said to Jess, um, and Dean said to Jess, if he fights, He'll come through it. And I, I don't know how you fight when you're unconscious, but apparently I did. Well, there's probably something innate there that uh, yeah. that kicks in, even though you're not conscious. I'm sure your body uh, yeah. you know, physically fights to survive. Yeah, Dean said that people who are in a coma like that, or I don't know if I was in a coma, but unconscious, they have, I guess, an unconscious um, vibe of uh, fighting to stick around. Yeah. That's a... That's, uh, that's combined with the drugs that apparently pulls you out of it. Yeah. It's, it's not a, it's not a journey I wanted to travel. No, no, no. So sir. five months out, yes. uh, as of the time of this recording, almost to the day, yes. five months out, you look good. You sound good. Thank you. When you first came back on the weekend show on the radio station, yeah. I could hear your voice was thin, Yeah, but that didn't last very long at all at all. And now you seem to be quite robust um, do you know how far along you are in recovery? Whether are you like 80% back? Are you, you know, when can you start yeah. doing, what are some of the things that you still can't do? And when will you be able to start doing them? I can't lift things. Um, I'm, I'm you know, I can't lift anything. Tell me about it. I am so tired of carrying this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Set up another one. Yeah, <laughs> I um, I'm not supposed to carry anything heavier than a milk jug, and th th that part is kind of embarrassing because you know I'm I'm with Jess and she's schlepping along. Yeah, oh boy, back, you know? people don't know yeah, if they see I, you coming out yeah, of Costco. Look at that and asshole! She's carrying everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so that that and you know she said, never mind everybody looking, and I think okay. Um, so I'm not allowed to lift anything and I haven't got the green light to go back to the gym and listen, I'm not a gym rat. I've never been a thin man. I'm a thinner man now than I was. Yeah. And but you've, that's been part of your lifestyle for several years now. Yeah. And I want to go back to it and I can't go back to it until the surgeon tells me that I, I'm allowed to go back to it. I've got green lights. I got green lights to fly because my blood clots that, that were, uh, you know, nearly took me out. They, they're they gone. Um, they looked at my legs and my chest and, and they're gone. So that that's a good thing. And now I can walk without any symptoms before I had my heart valve replaced. You know, I couldn't walk very far and I was apparently looking quite gray in December. So what I would like to do, because my legs are still very weak, my arms are still very weak, it's really unbelievable when you're in bed for 31 days, you know, and you 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 go to step on the floor. Yeah, you're like wobble, 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 yeah. wobble. It's it's really it's yeah, what quite, do they call that atrophy? Or uh, yeah, muscle, you have yeah, muscle atrophy. Yeah, your muscles all all are atrophied or atrophied, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm I'm looking forward so I can begin to lift small weights and and start to work on my legs so I can get them back. You know, I was a skater. I was a re hockey yeah. referee for a while. And my legs were, that's where all my power yeah, was, and that's yeah. gone now. Yeah, so, well, you got a big arse and big thighs. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been a pitcher. That's right, yeah. 
<laughs> you watch baseball, the good pitchers, yeah. all, most of them have great big arse and great I, big thighs because that's where the power comes I, from. I remember. I remember. I, was I with you when we, we saw Clemens pitch in Toronto? Yeah. And I turned to you and I said, Jesus Christ, he's got a big <laughs> arse. And you said, that's where all yeah. the power comes yeah. from. Very rarely do you yeah. see a pitcher with a... Pedro Martinez was an exception. Yeah. Pedro was not a big yeah, man. He was, he was a skinny little bastard. Yeah. bastard. Yeah, yeah, but boy, could he bring it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll never forget seeing Clemens in person because yeah. we were way, way away from home plate. And you could hear the the whistle of the ball in, <laughs> yeah. the, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the catcher's, catcher's mitt. mitt. Holy yeah. shit. What about dietary restrictions? Do you well, have those? I don't have any yet. I uh, I lost thirty one pounds. I put ten back on uh, to gain to gain strength. And um, if you you eat uh, eat ice chips for thirty one days and get fed through your nose, you look forward to having a sandwich no doubt, when you get yeah. out. Um, so I I haven't been given any yet because it was in early days of recovery. But I suspect when I see the cardiac surgeon, I'm going to get the what for. How about the bingo? Uh, the bingo, I, I'm unaware as to what the uh, restrictions mm-hmm. are or will be, uh, but I have enjoyed uh, a Caesar and uh, a glass of wine or two. Like um, the uh, uh, the bingo evenings that I've had used to have in the past. Right. Like we, Jess and I have one of those old fashioned um, Hollywood. You know, trays, liquor racks, right? You know, where that you know you, you'd see Cary Grant roll, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, pick up the martini shaker, and shall I make a drink? Um, <laughs> we have, we have one. That was of the, the worst Cary Grant I've ever heard, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me go. <laughs> um, and uh, it's co- it's covered in booze that we haven't touched in months and months, right? And months. Yeah. So I should tell my bingo story about my dad. Yeah. Do you remember that story? I, I, I it's going to come <laughs> to me as you. Yeah. Well, my, my father uh, was diagnosed with cancer in 1990, and uh, and it was very bleak. It was stage four, lung and kidney, and uh, you know the doctor basically told him get your affairs in order. And he somehow got connected with a doctor in Ottawa who had some kind of an experimental cancer treatment. So we the whole family went to Ottawa. I was living in uh, was I in Montreal by then? Yes, I was. I, think I was you were. in Montreal. Yeah. And so everybody met in Ottawa for dad to go see this doctor. And it was on Easter weekend. And so my mother dragged us all to church in Ottawa on Easter Sunday. And I don't remember what the denomination of the church was, but it was different from the United Church, which is where we went back in Fredericton, because at the United Church, for whatever reason, they they had a bit of a stick up their arse. And when you... When you did communion, they'd never give you wine. It would always be grape juice. So whatever church we went to in Ottawa, uh, this particular denomination did use the wine. So we're sitting there, and the scenario is, it's Easter Sunday, Dad's dying, we're in church, it's time for communion, the wine comes around, he gets his little glass, and he drinks it, and there's a pregnant pause, and he leans over to me, and he goes... Jesus Christ, that's real bingo. (laughs) (laughs) And that was so him. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that was just so him. And he didn't make it. The experimental treatment, whatever it was, it didn't work. And 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 he didn't make it. And I, you know, he was gone. I don't know how. I think he hung on for close to a year after that. That was early after early post-diagnosis. And I told that story. To several of his friends yeah. at the uh, at the at the wake, and uh, boy did they laugh! Yeah. Yeah, they all went, ah, "That's Bob." Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's and Bob. Especially uh, poignant given his diagnosis and the fact that he used Jesus Christ in church, in church. Easter <laughs> Sunday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and his timing was perfect. <laughs> the little pregnant pause. Yeah, what did, did you have to do the? Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to stifle my laughter. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's real bingo. <laughs> Uh, we'll take a second here to thank uh, a couple of longtime supporters of the podcast. As I always say when we uh, we do a little commercial for them, can't do the podcast without them. You know, we've got to, you know, we're not getting rich, but uh, we've got a few expenses. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled that these people want to be associated with us two knuckleheads. And it starts with uh, our friends at Jaguar Land Rover Laval. 
another family-run business, a terrific family that runs a dealership that you should not be intimidated to go to if you want to go look at nice luxury cars, even if you're not buying. And I mean that. Even if you're not buying and you just want to look at the beauty of some of these automobiles, go. They'll welcome you with open arms. And we might not be getting rich doing the podcast, but we are driving upscale cars. That's true. (laughs) Every time we do a, a podcast... Jaguar Land Rover Laval gives me a courtesy vehicle so that I can ferry Terry to and fro the studio. And we have the beautiful Jaguar XF30T sedan this time around. What a lovely, lovely car that is. And it's not, you might think, especially if you're a little bit older, you might associate Jaguars with being grandpa cars. This is not a grandpa car. This is a really nice, sporty, contemporary sedan. It's a beautiful, beautiful vehicle and one of many models you can choose from uh, in the Jaguar line. They've really gotten big into SUVs with the uh, F-Pace and the I-Pace and the E-Pace, their electric SUV. And as Terry says, go up there and have a look. They're the nicest bunch of people and it starts at the top with the brothers and co-owners Nino and Renato DiCubellis. Jaguar Land Rover Laval. Uh, The new car dealership is on Car 4, corner of Shamity, and right up the road on Shamity, like you say, pre-owned, but you go in there, and those cars are just all sparkling like brand-new vehicles. And they've got their uh, McLaren dealership right next door if you want to see supercars. That's like going to a car show. Yeah. And again, stick your head in, and they'd be glad to show you around, and they'll make you cappuccino while you're at it. JaguarLaval.com and LandRoverLaval.com, and thanks to Nino and Renato and their marketing director, Adrian McGrath, who has been our biggest supporter all along. True. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and a moment for our friends at the Mersons. I have been going to Merson Automotive uh, for, I don't know, two or 300 years now? At least. Um, it's, uh, it's really, it's a lovely story, I think, about the family at Mersons. Mark Merson's father. Mark Merson's retired. Mark Merson's father. Ben. Ben Merson. What a great name. St- yeah. Started that shop over 50 years ago, 60 years ago, something like it that. It was, I think, around 1970. There you go. Yeah. And um, and started to build a business uh, based on the fact that uh, you would be honest with people and look after your customers and hope that they would tell other customers what kind of wonderful treatment you got. Mark and Bonnie Merson ran that business for the longest time, and that's when I was first introduced to Merson by a friend. Again, word of mouth, somebody who was treated so well by the Mersons said to me, "Um, you shouldn't have taken your car there where I got ripped off. You should have taken it to the Mersons. Not long after that, I met uh, Mark and Bonnie and some of the employees that are still there at that shop, and uh, I never took my car anywhere else ever again. Um, to, to have that kind of trust with a, 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 a mechanic shop, an automotive shop, yeah. when you don't know anything about cars, when somebody comes out and says, um, your tie rods are broken. Huh? What? You know, and, and when somebody tells you that and tells you what it's going to cost, and you have this comfort that you know those people are telling the truth, yeah. and they're going to do the best they can to keep the bill as low as they can, that's the kind of feeling you get at Merson, where they sell tires. You can store your summer tires, store your winter tires. They have they've have like a regular clientele like you wouldn't believe. And just as the family business is three generations old, as you like to point out, so are some of the customer families as well. Grandpa took his car to Merson, your dad took yep. his car to Merson, and now you're taking your car to Merson. They're on St. Jacques, just west of Cavendish, and they're online at mersonauto.com. I asked you about the bingo. Yes. Uh, because I wanted to uh, run a few wine reviews past you. Actually, they're okay. not full reviews. It's just something funny I came across online. Uh, it popped up uh, on uh, one of the social uh, media channels or platforms one day. Uh, funny wine reviews or just <laughs> lines from different wine okay. reviews that really, these are from Wine Spectator. That's a magazine, yeah, Wine a, Spectator. Highly, well, it's also a website now. Highly respected. Uh, well, a lot of the liquor stores use the Wine Spectator reviews oh, yeah? uh, on the shelf. This is from their, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you have, like their readers 
have their own little like the group a group chat kind right. of thing among their readers. Sommeliers. No, 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 not sommeliers. It's a um, it's just it's just wine customers, wine wine enthusiasts giving their own right. reviews of different wines, and these are just a few of them. This rosé is a disastrous mix of foxy walnut and sherry aromas, followed by a shrill cacophony of flavor. Why, God? <laughs> Here's another one. If you like the suck... Sorry, let me start again because I can barely see that. If you like sucking on walnut skins, this bitter <laughs> offering is for you. <laughs> Tastes of bruised fruit with a horrible finish that gums up the palate like creacote in a chimney. <laughs> I don't know what creacote is, but creosote. it is. Creosote. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I, I need a bigger yeah. font. Creosote in a chimney. Yeah. I was going to say, if it's in a chimney, it can't be good. Yeah. I guess it's the film that builds up on the side of the chimney, yeah. is it? Is uh, that what a chimney sweep cleans out? Uh, yes, I think so. Burnt green peppers and grass. <laughs> Tastes like weak old gravy. <laughs> so you didn't enjoy it there. Yeah. And the last one is resembles cough medicine, but not as good. <laughs> so not yeah. some good wines there, apparently. Um, Poseidon is our producer. Yes, and um, he hasn't got to participate much in these uh, last episodes because we had a lot of guests this year. Do you consider me and him, when you when you are in the studio with us? Yeah. Or talk about us. Do you do you consider us old? No, older, older, yeah. older gentlemen. Yeah, right. uh, gentlemen. Wow. Mm. <laughs> uh, but not old. Old to me is like what? That's that's what I was going to ask. Well, you. like what? ten years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, would have yeah. considered you guys old. Yeah, but like now, <laughs> I consider old. Like uh, you need you need like a walking stick or right. like one of those walkers. Like that's old. Or you're yeah, in a home. It, it's all relative, and your perception changes with time. We used to laugh about. <laughs> uh, we'd hear these obituaries read on the radio, and someone would say, "So and so died. He was only eighty-one." And we'd laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. Only eighty-one, <laughs> snatched away in his prime at eighty-one. When Tina Turner died recently, and yeah. they said she was eighty-three, that I said to myself, "Really, only eighty-three? She, because I thought, you know, she, she was robbed of a few. Well, years. she could yeah. have squeezed a few more years. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, my mom's ninety, and yeah. and knock on wood, she's yeah. in good health. Your parents are in their late eighties yeah. and in good health. Yeah, you know, I guess a lot of it, I guess, has to do with well, genetics and lifestyle. I suppose are the and two biggest determining factors. I, I also the, the reason I ask it is because some days, and probably because I'm retired, so called retired, I sometimes I, I I have a moment where I think, Jesus Christ, I'm 65 because I don't feel 65. No, I, I, I'm I don't the same think way. I, I'm a year behind you at 64. Yeah. I don't feel 65. I, I don't think I think 65. I don't think we sound 65. My tits look 64. <laughs> <laughs> See episode four. <laughs> I think it was episode eight. Actually, okay, well, yeah. if you follow the yeah. podcast, you know what there, I'm talking yeah, about. There is a uh, there is a titty uh, yeah titty, titty, titty show. Yeah. <laughs> but I I don't like. Do you think about it? I, I no, I, I don't think I about, think it, about much. it much. Yeah, I only think about it if I see a really attractive. Younger woman, and I, and by younger now at right. my age, I'm yeah. talking like mid thirties, right? And I think, gosh, she wouldn't be interested in me. I'm too old for her. I could be her dad. Yeah, you know, that's when I think about it. Other than that, in terms of my my daily mentality, increasingly, I I'm discovering it's it's a number, yeah. you know, and you're, I, and you're as old as you think you are. Yeah, sort of and thing. I I don't I don't want to I don't want to you know uh, ruminate over it all the time, and I don't want to be sensitive about it. Um, you know, but when, you know, when you're talking about things like the evolution of the city, when we're talking to Bill Brownstein, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, you know, or somebody listening to podcasts and going, shut up, you old fuckers. Well, you, you know, know I think most of the people who listen to the podcast are, are probably in our wheelhouse. Yeah, uh, you're or, right. Or close to it. You're right. You know, or enjoy but listening to people reminisce and learning about what the city used right. to be. And it's, um, when we looked at some of the, the breakdowns of the people that were listening, I was quite, quite pleasantly surprised. And uh, the daughter of our late great friend Mike Sinell, Val Sinell, mm -hmm. I was with them on on Monday night, and uh, she said, uh, "You know, you're in to do the podcast. When 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 did the new episodes start coming out?" 
And I said, oh, you know, I think we'll put them out uh, Wednesday, June 7th or whatever it was. And uh, she said, oh, good. I'm really looking forward to it. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, I never miss an episode. Oh, never. nice. And I thought that was really nice. Yeah. And I asked her what she liked about it. And she said she liked um, the guests that we have and uh, uh, the topics that we weave in and out of. Because right. we do, um, when we put the podcast together, it's not rehearsed. We never, in all the years we've worked together, we've never rehearsed anything. And I guess that's apparent on some days. Yes, it <laughs> but, can be tangent. <laughs> Tangential, if yes. that's the word. Yeah. Tangential. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, um, it's all, what's that word? It's all, uh, it, it's over the map. <laughs> it's all over the map, but it's, um, it's a uh, garden oak. Yikinak. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say I was old? I yeah, don't, yeah, you know that, uh, I don't speak in you. Organic. There you go. You know what? You know, <laughs> <laughs> what in blazes? Garden nuke and <laughs> eunuch. <laughs> if I ever get if I ever get two Siberian huskies, yep. I'm naming them Garden nuke and eunuch. And just go into a supermarket and say, "I'm looking for the Garden nuke lemons." <laughs> yeah, you mean organic? They're right beside the eunuch. You know. That's uh, that's something that I I've always thought was important, and I thought worked for us on the radio. Yeah, there was a spontaneity to it; you never knew it was coming. And the danger of that is you fall asleep, mm -hmm. or you know, I uh, you know, it it doesn't work. It can go off the rails yeah. sometimes, yeah. but you know, that's that's the way it goes. Yes, and I don't think we're laissez faire about it. I mean, we're also there is an element of preparation. We're not completely winging it. Yeah. But we're, we get a little absent-minded. We didn't take a picture with Pierre. Yeah. We didn't take a picture with yeah, Bill Brownstein. With and now there's nobody to take a picture that's with. That's right, yeah. We'll take a picture with Poseidon. Poseidon. Hey, yeah. Him, though. He's very handsome. You Would know. you like to contribute? Is there something you'd like to get off your chest, Poseidon? You haven't had an opportunity to. No, I'm just enjoying this. <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, you guys' company uh, so mm -hmm. far. Okay. Uh, it's a different so vibe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you got another 10 we'll minutes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a different vibe when you guys are in studio. How uh, so? That's interesting to me. How so? Um, a lot less swearing. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's so, funny because both Ted and I can be very blue. Yeah. You mean a different vibe with us versus some of the other podcasts that you do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what I mean. So oh, I, yeah, I like yeah. that. It's very calm. So when it's you and uh, Pantelis and Mike, or or you and uh, Guido and the guys uh, on the intellectuals, it's yeah. it can be a little more uh, unsavory in terms of the language. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but also, also, I find the story is very interesting. It's stuff. Oh, that's cool. Uh, like Thank I learned you. about, I've lived in the city all my life. And I hear things that I never would have really went out looking for myself. Got you. Okay. But they're still interesting to me. Well, there you go. That you goes back I mean? to what I said a couple of minutes ago, yeah. that uh, maybe that's why Val listens, too. She yeah. enjoys hearing things about the city her dad and her mom yeah. uh, grew up in. Also, your Uncle Terry, I would imagine, with Val. Yeah, Are you? Pretty, yeah, pretty much. And And when I think about it, now that you say that, when I was a kid, I liked hanging around the adult table. A little bit too much, you know. Sometimes my parents would say, uh, "Shoo you away." Well, you know, when when I got older, when I was like 14, 13, 14, 15, I was welcome at the adult table. Mm -hmm. But when we were kids and my parents were having people over, we got hot dogs at five thirty, and then it was go to the basement and only come upstairs if you're bleeding. You know, like <laughs> it's adult time now. Yeah. Um, but as I got older, I was more fascinated by adult conversation, and when my parents had people over, I wanted to be part of it. Yeah. So and I, I th and I think I learned a lot from that, and uh, I think maybe that's what Poseidon is saying, and maybe that's what Val was saying. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of lore. Like I, I, yeah. I, I like a good story. So like all the uh, video games I play, the movies I watch, I love a good story. So the more I consume of like a good story, I don't know. The more I don't know, it, it, I enjoy that kind of thing. So let's spin a yarn about Voswin. Yes. How about hey. that? Hey. Sean Smith, who is the founder and president of Voswin, an engineering firm, called us out of the blue one day and said, I would like to sponsor your podcast. And, and we, we laughed and yeah. laughed. <laughs> <laughs> laughed at ourselves mostly yeah. because we yeah. thought, why would an engineering firm want to sponsor this podcast? And Sean said, because I think your audience could use my service. 
And lo and behold, in the seasons that he has sponsored, he has gotten inquiries from listeners of the podcast about his services, which in a nutshell uh, is uh, he can help you through the process of invention or innovation. Anything that requires an engineering component, whether it's uh, an invention like from scratch or you have an existing business or a service that uh, you want to introduce a, a new element into it and it requires an engineering component, if you don't know how to approach it, Voswin does and they can help you with it. Electrical engineering and design, industrial engineering and design, Mechanical engineering and design and software development are their areas of expertise, and they can take you from the very beginning of the process, ideation, as I like to call it. Not even sure that's a word, but what I'm it talking is about there is, yeah. I think it is a word, that the, the creation of the idea, right. the beginning of the idea in your head, they take it from there to putting the actual physical product or service in your hands and they'll help you get it to market as well. They know the whole deal uh, from beginning to end. Check them out at Voswin. That's V-O-Z-W-I-N dot com. And thanks again, Sean, for uh, your faith and uh, trust in us. Another family we want to say thanks to are the uh, family that run Matla Bonheur. Mattress place, yes. A uh, place where they only dedicate everything in the store to a better night's sleep. So... Uh, linens, yep. Pillows, yep. Got that. Futons, yep. Uh, you want a fancy bed that goes up and down and bends in the middle and whatever else. You got that. New sheets, comforter. Uh, new sheets, comforter. Check all of those. Uh, mattress, simple mattress for a guest room. Fancy mattress, uh, that you want to replace because you haven't replaced your mattress in way too long. Uh, we did that. My wife and I waited way too long to replace a mattress and, uh, it just, you get a new mattress that changes the way you sleep. Um, and I met Norm uh, probably 10, 15 years ago now and asked him about his passion for this. And he said, I, I don't know. It's just something I love to do. I love to think that I can change the way uh, people have a good night's sleep. Started the company with a small store on Gwynne Boulevard in St. Genevieve that's still there. Um, and all these stores at Met Lab on our, are beautifully designed, as I like to say, you won't have to step around a washing machine or a dishwasher uh, to uh, look into buying a nice mattress when you go to Matla Bonheur. Um, and uh, Norm and his uh, daughter Valerie, his son Kevin, they're all part of the business. The family uh, is all part of the business. It's a Quebec-owned, family-run business that uses largely Canadian suppliers that take a lot of pride in what they do. And they've got stores all over the place in the greater Montreal area on and off the island. And like I said, there's places you can buy a mattress. I know that. There's lots of department stores and other places you can go. But make sure before you make a decision that you make Matla Bonheur one of your stops so you can have the amazing shopping experience and get a, a great deal on a, on a great mattress and a great night's sleep. Matlabonheur.ca Shall uh, we go out on Tweet Sheet 2.0? We shall go out on Tweet Sheet 2.0. Uh, and we we, we uh, should say that uh, there's two Tweet Sheets on this episode because we missed a Tweet Sheet on one of the earlier episodes. We did, yeah. Also, yes. also since you guys enjoy the Tweet Sheets, uh, uh, something just popped into my head that you guys may appreciate. Okay. Uh, speaking of mattresses that bend. <clears throat> yes. So I got her a mattress that bends, but she no longer bends her legs open for me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, we don't Sorry, just one of those insane thoughts. Do you that use I that in your stand-up? Yep. No, I just thought about it. Oh, actually. yeah? Well, just, write it down. <laughs> I write it down. <laughs> All right, here hold we on, go. Uh, oh, we did that one already. Yes, yes. So we got to do... Uh, we ended on that. I just and we wanna... ended on that one, yeah. So now right. we've got, here's one, Tara, from at Davis Stated. I'm terrible with names. Just ask my kids, bag face and balls. Bag face and balls. That's amazing. Yeah. From at Cool Math Game, the war on non-fungible tokens is much scarier than whatever the hell Vietnam is, Grandpa, you <laughs> fucking idiot. Go back to your room. <laughs> uh, this one's amazing. 
Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> pretty harsh, eh? Poor old grandpa. And from at I'm the Slime, Tony the Tiger definitely did steroids because I've been eating Frosted Flakes for years and I look like shit. <laughs> Tony did look good, didn't he? Tony did look Thin good. Thin little waist, yeah. broad shoulders. Had a great voice, too. Yeah, oh, did he ever? Yeah. Big pipes. Yeah. Should have done radio. <laughs> yeah. That's it, Ter. Oh, that's it. Yeah, okay. That's right. the last of the okay. tweet sheet. Before we go, yeah. along with thanking uh, Poseidon for his ongoing yeoman service as our producer, we should thank Pantelis and Mike Ward for providing us with the studio and the infrastructure and everything they do Look what to I get wrote this down podcast here. on the air. Yeah, yeah there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to cry. Um, don't you dare cry. After you've had open heart surgery, you, you cry a little easier. I, oh, yeah. Apparently. Well, listen, I yeah. haven't had open heart surgery, and I and cry, cry easier. easily. Yeah. I'm like my grandfather now. I used to go mow my grandfather's lawn. He'd give me $5 and then cry when I left. <laughs> And he was about the age I am now. Right. Yeah. I um, uh, I, I wanted to go out on these thank yous, too. First of all, um, we looked at some, uh, it was a, an amalgamation of statistics of the podcast that Pantella sent us. And a lot of people seem to enjoy it. Let me just say that. And we're deeply grateful to the people who say, we love the podcast, we can't wait for the new episodes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. There's, uh, it, it means a great deal to me because um, this is what I do, this is what I've done for a very long time, and uh, when people tell you you're washed up and you can't do it anymore, it's nice to have somebody come in and say to you, hey, listen, come to our studio and and get on the new train and do a podcast. That's and to be clear, at. nobody who ever listened to you said that. That no. was that was the people who looked at your salary and went, no, no. that's too much. Get somebody cheaper. So uh, if you listen, thanks so much. And and to Mike Ward and Pantelis, who are so encouraging and, and do all the work and get the episodes out and everything else, they provided us with this platform and a real dose of encouragement at the beginning when uh, we didn't know where the hell this was going. Yeah. So. Um, we're deeply, deeper, uh, deeply, deeply grateful. We are. <laughs> and, um, of course, uh, we'll have to say thanks once again to Jaguar Land Rover Laval, to Voswin, to the Mersons, to my friends at Matla Bonheur, and to David Drucker and the people at the UPS Store Canada. The podcast doesn't happen without their support. Thank you to them all. And thank you, Poseidon. Yes, thank you, Poseidon. My pleasure, gentlemen. And thank you, gentlemen, for coming in studio. And I hate, I hate that it's episodes. over. Yeah? Well, yeah, I'd like to record another 10 Yeah, episodes. yeah, we will. Yeah. Fuck it! <laughs> <laughs> Let's not all do them in the same day next time, though. I'm not fucking leaving! <laughs> okay. <laughs>